So I was given this, uh, what I think is kind of an interesting topic of the meaning of residual disease. And I, what, of course, what we're talking about here is, is what happens when patients are treated with neoadjuvant therapy, uh, whether they have a pathologic complete response or whether they have residual disease, you know, what are the implications for that? Uh, and I think this has become very important uh, these days because neoadjuvant therapy is, is now commonly used. In fact, it's really the standard of care for patients with triple negative breast cancer, with stage two or higher cancers, or HER2 positive stage two or higher cancers. You know, the, the guidelines fr from St. Gallen uh, previously have, have made it very clear that we should be treating patients with that clinical presentation with neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, so it's important that we understand the implications for patients uh, who, whose cancer responds completely, that is, has, has a pathologic complete response, or does not uh, respond as well and has residual disease after completion of, of their uh, neoadjuvant treatment. Now, we know from a, a number of very large studies that having residual disease is prognostic or, or the converse, having a pathologic complete response is very prognostic for an individual patient. We know that those patients who have a pathologic complete response have substantially better outcomes than those who do not, particularly for patients with hormone receptor negative HER2 positive cancers and for triple negative cancers, uh, where the prognostic value of PCR is the strongest. And we also know that patients who have residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy uh, can benefit from escalation of their treatment if they have triple negative or HER2 positive breast cancers. For triple negative breast cancers uh, that have residual disease, adding adjuvant capecitabine substantially improves outcome. Uh, and similarly, adding TDM1 for patients with HER2 positive breast cancers after neoadjuvant therapy who have residual disease also is quite beneficial. The dilemma or the, the conundrum here is that it's certainly prognostic for the individual patient uh, to have uh, a PCR. Uh, it does not appear that a new therapy that improves past CR necessarily improves long-term outcome. Um, and that's where there's kind of been some misunderstanding about the significance of, of PCR. And I think that's something that, that we need to keep in mind. Um, there are other roles uh, for using PCR or residual disease as an endpoint. Um, we're hoping that not only can we use residual disease as a way to identify patients who can escalate therapy, conversely, we think it's potentially useful to take patients who have a PCR and consider de-escalation of therapy. So kind of you, uh, taking the opposite approach for the patients who have a PCR. Uh, and there are now studies underway uh, that are actually testing that hypothesis, taking patients who have early stage breast cancer, particularly HER2 positive breast cancer, uh, treating them with a truncated amount of neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy and HER2 therapy. And if they have a PCR, stopping chemotherapy at that point and just continuing with HER2 therapy, such as trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And for those patients who don't have a PCR, then adding additional uh, therapy and potentially even escalating therapy beyond that. Uh, so there are now in the United States uh, a large cooperative group study that's testing that approach, whether we can use PCR to de-escalate therapy. And there recently was reported at San Antonio last year, uh, a pilot study showing that that approach is actually quite uh, well received by both patients and uh, uh, investigators. And so I think that does uh, bode well for such de-escalation approaches, and we need to prove that this does lead to good outcomes and uh, less toxicity than our current standard. I think lastly, in terms of the, the importance of residual disease, it can be a window into potential mechanisms of resistance. Uh, intuitively, one would expect uh, that, that cancer cells that remain after neoadjuvant therapy are enriched for mechanisms of resistance. And there are now studies underway uh, and that have been completed that are uh, analyzing the genomics and proteomics of the residual cancers to 
determine uh, what uh, led to the resistance. And I think that's uh, a approach that will be useful going forward. Um, and then lastly, I just want to reiterate this uh, misconception about PCR. You know, again, for an individual patient, having a complete response is highly prognostic, but it's not an end in itself. It's just a surrogate for favorable outcome. So it does not make sense to intensify therapy uh, just to achieve a PCR. It's not, that's not necessarily going to improve outcomes for a patient. And I think that's something that you know, we as, as oncologists need to remember that PCR does have limitations and it's not an end to itself. So I think those were the kind of major messages that we wanted to get across uh, with this presentation.